You are listening to Parliament Matters, a Hansard Society production supported by the Joseph Rowntree Charitable Trust. Learn more at hansardsociety.org.uk slash pm. Welcome to Parliament Matters, the podcast about the institution at the heart of our democracy, Parliament itself. I'm Ruth Fox. And I'm Mark Darcy. Coming up. Does Parliament have a potty mouth problem? The Speaker took MPs to task this week for falling short of the standards of good temper and moderation that should characterise parliamentary debate, amid accusations about a dramatic increase in use of bad language in the Chamber. But is it really that fruity? A deal is done in Northern Ireland. It could reopen the Northern Ireland Assembly, which could emerge from the suspended animation it's been in for the best part of two years. But has the same deal rubbed salt into the still open wounds of Brexit on the Conservative backbenches? But first, the Rwanda Bill. We called it right last week when we said the Lords would not oppose the legislation at second reading. But what did we learn from the debate and what happens now? So Ruth, let's start with a quick return to Rwanda and that vote in the House of Lords. As we were predicting last time, peers didn't in the end oppose the bill and just strike it down at second reading. They almost never do that anyway, and it didn't seem like a very likely possibility, as we were saying last week. But all the same, there were a few interesting little nuggets that Mm. emerged from that debate. Not least the voting figures around that second reading vote. There was just a handful of crossbench peers joined the Liberal Democrats and the Greens, and I think one Clyde Cymru peer, Lord Wigley, in opposing the bill at second reading. The rest of the House was quite happy to see it go through. On the general principle, it's what always happens in the Lords. You don't oppose government bills and just strike them down. You gut them when you get your teeth into the detail later on. Yes, or as, as Lord Anderson of Ipswich, who we had on the pod after the Supreme Court case, uh, just, just before Christmas, said, the seriousness of these issues means that we owe the Commons the courtesy of our careful consideration of them, which basically means, yes, let's amend it. <laughs> As we see fit. (laughs) So Piers will be sinking their remaining teeth into the detail of the bill. I think it comes back on something like the 13th of February for the start of committee stage. But that's not when the real action takes place. Committee stage is a kind of shadow boxing phase where coalitions are built up around particular potential changes to the bill and ministers respond about questions on detail. So it's an early preliminary shadow boxing phase. And the real action will take place at report stage, which I imagine now will be in March. Yes, it's looking like that in terms of the timetable. I'm just to go back to the vote. You're saying there's some interesting patterns. I mean, 84 peers voted to decline to give it a second reading. And as you say, it was predominantly the Liberal Democrats, the Greens, the Plaid Cymru. But there were eight Labour peers voted with the Liberal Democrats, including Shami Chakrabarti, Michael Cashman. But the majority of of Labour peers basically voted with their feet and stayed away. So they were present in the debate, took part, but didn't participate in the vote. It was sort of a form of abstention. And interestingly, the crossbenchers, only five crossbenchers. Yeah, and only five of them voted to decline to give it a second reading. But interestingly, one of them, Baroness Hale, formerly the head of the Supreme Court. I dare say she will pop up in the debates that are yet to come around the, the, the detail of the bill. But the crossbenchers are a critical part of all this. If you're going to defeat the government and vote something down, you need not only the main opposition, the Labour Party, you need most of the crossbenchers, always remembering that there's no such thing as a crossbench whip. They don't vote as a block, although they do have a substantial herd instinct and will follow the lead of prominent figures sometimes. And as well as, of course, as the Liberal Democrats. So it's only if you get that whole sort of rainbow coalition that the government can lose. And that rainbow coalition assembles itself quite often in the Lords, mm. which is you know habitually defeating the government tens, even hundreds of times in every parliamentary session these days. Yeah. But there were, there were some really high-quality speeches in, in the debate. I know one of our favourite peers is Lord Hennessy, Peter Absolutely. Hennessy, former journalist and, and constitutional historical savant. And he gave a, you know, frankly, a wonderful, a very short, the speeches were quite short and pithy, a wonderful speech about the rule of law, he said, has a fair claim to be the most lustrous of our values, almost talismanic in its properties. So anything that threatens, weakens or tarnishes our crucial defining value, the inspirational principle for governing and living well together is a first order matter. Yes, and he ended with that devastating one liner, is this really the country we want to be? Yeah. Ooch. So look out for many more high quality contributions later. I was struck by one though, Lord Kinul, the convener of the crossbenches, rather disagreed with something we said last week. We said 
that we didn't think this bill came under the Salisbury Convention mm. under which Lord, the Lords don't strike down a bill that's been in the governing party's election manifesto. We didn't think that the Rwanda scheme was in their manifesto. Lord Kinul seems to think that it was and apparently is, is preparing a memo on this very subject. So we wait with interest to yeah, see what happens. Yeah, he, he talked about preparing papers on the Salisbury Addison Convention. It wasn't clear who for. And be afraid, when. be very afraid. <laughs> but um, he talked about the convention having a number of aspects to it, one of which being that a government bill, as he described it, with manifesto characteristics will be given a second reading. And interestingly... Sort of manifesto adjacent. Yeah, and interestingly, Lord Lisvain, former clerk of the House of Commons, again, we had on the, the pod a few episodes ago for a, a discussion about sort of you know, his, his thoughts on the Constitution, the state of things. He talked also about the fact that we kind of get a bit obsessed with this manifesto issue. He, he talked about the manifesto of the Attlee government in 1945 ran to only eight pages. Now it's sort mm. of, you know, 100 pages of much more sort of philosophical tract rather than specific detailed legislative mm. plan. And he talked back about the, the Joint Committee on Conventions in 2006. He sort of harked back to that and said he thought it was better to treat the endorsement of the elected House... So the, the fact that the Commons has passed the bill as being sufficient democratic authority under the, the convention. There's going to be a lot of debate around this. And I think one of the long-term side effects of the Salisbury Addison Convention all those years ago is that manifestos become, in a sense, constitutional documents. If a proposal is listed in the manifesto, the Lords won't throw it out at second reading, at least, even if they, mm. sort of, as I was talking about earlier, gut the detail of it later on in mm. later stages of consideration. I can imagine that we start to invent new categories here. There's manifesto commitments, <laughs> there's manifesto adjacent, maybe even manifesto curious, and uh, <laughs> who knows where this will take us. Right, so if we move on from Rwanda, Mark, shall we talk about the Speaker's comments this week, just before Prime Minister's questions, where he basically made a statement to the House and said that recent exchanges had been lively, but he felt that they were falling below the standards expected in the in the House. And he talked about the fact that there would be use of props in the chamber, which isn't permitted. And of course, that was an allusion to the Prime Minister wielding a document to Keir Starmer at one session of PMQs. He talked about some of the language used in questions has fallen short of the standards of Good temper and yeah. moderation that is expected yeah. w- in parliamentary debate. Words that we probably don't want to repeat on a family podcast when we know children might be listening. So. <laughs> yes, but you can imagine the, the S word and the F word are, have been at the heart of this, the discussion. So there's a story in Politico this week, which I think has prompted some of this, that they highlight what they say is an increase in the use of bad language in the chamber. They talk about it as being record levels of cursing in debate. Well, I mean, we've got to set it in context. They've got this sort of wonderful chart, but it's it's presented in such a way that it looks like a huge spike, but it's actually gone up from zero to two <laughs> um, in one case. Um, and you a know, two hundred percent increase. Yeah, surely. yes, exactly. So you you know the statistics, and you know you know the story. Uh, actually, two is not a two hundred percent increase on zero, but uh, yeah, a yeah, mathematician yeah. to save any mathematicians <laughs> coming to get me. But of course, there's there's a recent James Cleverly incident yeah. where. He was reported to have... Used dis- a disobliging word about Middlesbrough. Of course, Yvette Cooper quoted James allegedly what James Cleverley had said about the Rwanda policy itself as being back. Um, uh, not to mention Sir Keir Starmer, uh, the, the leader of the opposition, the Prime Minister in waiting himself, using a word that um, the Speaker, I don't think, would have liked either. No. Although, apparently, in terms of, of the rules around unparliamentary language, if you say the word directly to the, the fellow member, that's unparliamentary. But if you quote somebody else saying it, so I think in this case he was quoting the Times headline, that's permitted. (laughs) (laughs) I think there's a very delicate hair being very neatly split there. But there is a general feeling that the temper of parliamentary debate is getting a bit nasty. And maybe that's just a natural development when there's an election on the horizon. Pre-electoral tension is taking hold here. and (laughs) P.E.T. Call it what you will, but they, they are just the pot is really simmering quite nicely and has a tendency to boil over at the slightest provocation at the moment. But beyond that, I mean, Prime Minister's question time is becoming awful. I mean, it's it's always I think been it's performative. Been awful for a while, but it's yeah. always been amateur theatrics. Yeah. Sometimes it's absolutely toe curling, but so often I feel a small portion of my soul die every time I watch it. 
that I think it somehow got worse. Uh, perhaps it's actually the failure of artistry that neither mm. of the two main protagonists in Prime Minister's Question Time would ever be called a great, capital G, great parliamentarian. There just isn't that level of sort of delicate oratorical artistry yeah. that the William Hague's, the Tony Blair's did have. And so it's both a bit clunking, but also incredibly crude and really rather dull and boring. And I think the general public probably hate it, actually. And this is always a John Burko line. The public hate this sort of thing, he used to say when he was in well, the chair. I mean, when we've done research at the Hansel Society on this subject in previous years, I mean, we did once look at PMQs and got some focus groups together to watch it. And we've had other focus groups that are sort of more generic, talking about people's attitudes to, to politics and parliament generally. And it always comes up. Why are they behaving like that? That's their workplace. If I behaved like that in my workplace, cheering and jeering at my colleagues across the table, I'd get sacked. Why are they behaving like toddlers in the playground? And it's not just the no mark backbenchers doing mm. this. Yeah, the, the, I think that at the last BMQs, the, the chief whip Simon Hart was, was being rebuked for his behaviour. Yeah, I mean, he was told by the speaker, look, you're getting very carried away. And this is like 10 minutes after the speaker's given his statement asking MPs to raise their game. The, the lack of leadership on both front benches, frankly, because both, you know, both the government and the opposition front bench are, are equally at fault. But I think we've also got to then start to question, does the Speaker now have to start? It's no good making the statements and then having to intervene, as he did this week, on at least two occasions to reprimand MPs and threaten to throw some of them out. As he puts it, you'll be going for a cup of tea. If he doesn't actually do it, and he keeps saying each week... I'm going to do this, this is the threat, you know, if you don't behave. And until he does, I don't think anything's going to change. Yeah, I think that's what's got to happen now. He's got to make good his threats and start swinging people out of the chamber if they don't behave, because otherwise it's just going to escalate. Because he can quote that line that he's so fond of, of good temper and moderation are the hallmarks of parliamentary debate at the beginning of every PMQs from now till the next parliament. And it won't make a blind bit of difference unless there's actual enforcement action, I'm afraid. Yeah, yeah. That's just the temper of the time, I think, at the moment. Yeah. But just going back to this question of what language you can news. I think there's a bit of a misunderstanding sometimes. People think that, particularly journalists, I think, think that there's sort of a, a list of words you cannot say. And they used to be in Erskine May, but they no longer have that. Mm. They've sort of done away with maintaining <laughs> this list of precedents where words have been ruled out by the Speaker of the Day. And they now have this sort of line about the context matters. I rather missed the list, actually, because it was full of all these wonderful Victorian expressions. You can't call someone a gutter snipe or a jack-o'-lantern or whatever. Still yeah. pigeon. Yeah, and, and you, you can imagine <laughs> Charles Dickens sitting in the parliamentary press gallery in the 1820s or 1830s, whenever it was, hearing some of these expressions being used. But I doubt if many of them have been used in the last half century or so. But they're all solemnly listed quite frequently yeah. as the things you're not allowed to say. You're not allowed to say someone's a hypocrite. You're not allowed to say someone's a liar. You're not allowed to imply someone is drunk. The famous incident of, I think it was Claire Short in the yeah. early 80s, then, accusing Alan Clark, Alan Clark yeah. of not being sober at yeah. the dispatch box. Yeah. When indeed he wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> Those late night sittings. <laughs> but just going back to the point about the lying issue. Yes, you can't, as an MP, accuse one of your colleagues in the debate just as sort of part of the natural flow of the discussion. He's a liar, she's a liar. But if you think they have lied, you can do something. You can seek to table a motion specifically making that claim They've got advance notice of it, which is part of the procedure of fairness to give them notice that that's mm. an accusation that's being levelled at them. And then there can be a debate on it and the House can vote. So there is a mechanism to tackle the question of lying. And when I see MPs in recent years, we've had, we've had Ian Blackford, we've had Storm Butler accusing other MPs of, of lying, particularly Boris Johnson, of course, before he, he left the House. They make those accusations as part of the general debate. They know what they're doing. They know they're going to get called up by the speaker. They know they're probably going to get asked to leave. But it's a good YouTube clip to but stick on the website. It's an excellent YouTube clip. And if they were serious about pursuing it, they'd seek to table a motion so that they could put the claim to the House. Yeah, I suppose they could end up being labelled as kind of vexatious litigants if... if, if. <laughs> Johnson's case. <laughs> if they did so. So on to, uh, on to Ruth, the, the, the week's big political event thus far, which has been the announcement of a new deal over Northern Ireland. The backstory here is that the Democratic Unionists 
in Northern Ireland have been boycotting the Northern Ireland Assembly, make it impossible for it to operate because of all the rules it has to have cross-party consent for a couple of years now because they are very vexed by the internal border that's been created between the Great Britain mainland, if you like, and Northern Ireland as a result of the special status of Northern Ireland of having to maintain an open border with the Republic, which is, of course, inside the European single market. And the, the squaring the circle of the UK being outside the single market and not having a closed border mm. with border points to the Republic has been one of the huge difficulties that's bedeviled Brexit ever since the 2016 vote. There have been all sorts of attempts to try and get answers to it, the Windsor Protocol, and the latest modifications that have been agreed in a sort of tripartite negotiation between the DUP, the UK government, and the European Commission to come up with some sort of workable solution. And uh, to Hosanna's, at least from the two main party front benches this week, uh, Sir Geoffrey Donaldson has signed up to an agreement Agreement here, and that means that the Assembly may come out of its suspended animation and resume business and bring back devolved government to Northern Ireland perhaps as soon as next week. Yeah, I mean, at the time we're recording now, we haven't heard what the timetable is going to be, but the suggestions are that if things are on track, I mean, as we are recording now, the House of Commons will be debating a couple of statutory instruments that flow from this new deal and assuming that they go through as they will because Labour, main party of opposition in the, in the House is, is backing the government on this. Um, assuming that all, all goes well, then I think the, the, the timetable is likely to be that they get the Assembly back on Saturday probably. So the Speaker of the, of, of the Northern Ireland Assembly, Alex Maskey, has written to all the members of the, of the Assembly and, and basically given them warning that the, the Assembly might be recalled at 24 hours' notice. And he's in an odd position himself, isn't he? Because he's not actually re-standing mm. as a member of the Assembly. He's kind of there in a almost emeritus capacity now. Yeah, so he stood down at the Assembly election in 2022. And when the Assembly reconvened after the election in, in May 2022, they couldn't agree on a, the election of a new Speaker because the DUP didn't want the Assembly to get back up and running. So he's had to preside for the last two years as the Speaker of the Assembly to bring it back if there was an opportunity, as there is now, but without really any business to do. So yeah. he's been in a very curious position. He'll preside over the election of his successor if the Assembly does indeed get up and running and then be able to leave the building his job done. Yeah, and um, so we think that probably would take place on Saturday. The Assembly reconvenes. The first item of business will have to be the election of of a new Speaker. Assuming that is all sorted, there'll then be the nomination of the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister. So First Minister will be the Sinn Féin representative, Michelle O'Neill, and then it's questions about who will be who the, the deputy DUP first put up as the second party in the chamber. Yeah, and I've seen some of the Belfast-based journalists speculating that it might be Emma Little Pengelly, who I think was an MP. Yes, she was. Yeah, to... she was uh, yeah. briefly an MP and is now taking her seat in the assembly. So yeah. watch this space. So then once they are in place, the rest of the government ministers will be nominated. They're divided between the parties. And then you'd probably have the government meeting on the Monday. And then they think that the, the, the parliamentary committees, the assembly committees on the Tuesday would then be selected. And then gradually the normal stuff of politics, dealing with the state of the health service, sorting out the public sector strikes and all the other things yeah. that have been bedeviling public services in Northern Ireland will suddenly be on the agenda in a way they just haven't been able to yeah. be for a very long time. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, in Westminster, there, there, there was some very interesting politics on the sidelines of this announcement. I mean, it was all lovey-dovey between the two front benches, with Hilary Benn, the shadow Northern Ireland secretary, praising Chris Heaton-Harris, the Northern Ireland secretary, for the work he had done, saying what a great deal this was and how hard he had worked. But slightly off stage on the back benches, I don't know if the DUP exactly has back benches because there aren't <laughs> that many of them, but one of their MPs, Sammy Wilson, was distinctly dyspeptic about this deal and used a phrase about the government that really struck me. He, he, he said this was a cowardly Brexit betraying government which interested me because the DUP has historically had very strong links with the hardcore Eurosceptics on the Conservative benches. And I wonder if those are views that are shared by some of the most Brexity Conservative bank benches. Certainly Therese Villas, who's in that group, didn't sound particularly happy about the deal either. And I do wonder if salt is being rubbed mm. in unhealed Tory wounds. She's a former Northern Ireland secretary as yes, well. Yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah. indeed. Yeah, yeah. 
I mean, there is a sense, some of the, I mean, I'm no you know, expert on the detail of this and the trade issues are so complicated, but quite a number of people who are the sort of the academic experts on this are saying quite a bit of this is more presentational rather than substantive. I think of it in quite simplistic terms as, you know, there's going to be more, more trade going through the green channel rather than the red channel um, in future. I think what you've got is an underlying fear from Brexiteers on particularly the Conservative bank benches that implicit in this agreement is the thought that the UK is going to stay pretty aligned to a lot of the regulation inside the EU single market because that kind of smooths the deal with Northern Ireland. And so they don't get the kind of deregulation and breaking away from what they regard as EU overregulation that for some of them was the whole point of having Brexit in the first place. Yeah, well, we talked last week about progress with the retained EU law reform programme. And then Sir Bill Cash, chair of the European Scrutiny Committee, um, he was making the point to Kemi Badenoch, the business secretary, that they are, as he described it, running out of time to put in place the sort of the, the, these, the deregulation and the sort of moving away from EU regulations that he wants. Now, he wasn't explicit about his thinking on that, but one can imply that he was probably thinking a general election is coming. We're not looking good in the polls. If we don't get this done fairly quickly, we're not mm. going to. They're not going to look forward to Killer Starmer doing it. No. But going back to um, to Geoffrey Donaldson, I mean, he's he's not going to be First Minister or Deputy First Minister in Northern Ireland because he's not a member of the Assembly, but he's negotiating this deal as, as leader of the DUP based in Westminster. But I was very struck there were a lot of positive things said about him in the debate and obviously he's trying to support his position and sort of underpin him given the differences within the, the DUP. He's had to play a really difficult hand and quite a lot of the politicians at Westminster were, were quite complimentary. Yes, and, and when there were critics, he was fairly dismissive of them too. He quoted this line, which I think is from Teddy Roosevelt via Richard Nixon, the person in the arena is the one who gets things done rather than the people in the audience shouting commentary at him. Yeah. Well, talking about the man in the arena, somebody else who's um, put his foot forward to head into the arena away from the the galleries is Paul Wall. We talked about this last week, Mark, the journalist for the Eye, political commentator for the Eye. He sought the selection in Rochdale for the Labour Party for the by-election following Tony Loy's death. The meeting was held over the weekend and uh, he didn't get it, came second. He didn't get it. Azar Ali, a uh, local councillor, was chosen instead. And Paul wrote a very interesting piece about his experiences on the selection yeah. trail, if you like. And remember that in some constituencies, it's the selection battle that's the crucial hurdle to becoming the MP because the party has a, such a big majority in it. And, and so it's, it's a, a bit of a rite of passage for pretty much everybody who's in the House of Commons is to getting through that selection committee. Of course, this is a fast-track selection because it's for a by-election that's mm. going to be held in the not-too-distant future. And he said it was far more gruelling, and people had warned him it was going to be one of the most gruelling political experiences that you could possibly face. You have to demonstrate local credentials, you have to give your pitch of what sort of politician you're going to be, you have to answer policy questions on things that concern the voters there. Paul Wall was asked about Gaza and apparently was taking a somewhat more radical approach than Sir Keir Starmer in terms of calling for a ceasefire in Gaza. So a whole slew of issues like that that he suddenly had to feel. Apparently he based himself back in his childhood bedroom in his mum's house (laughs) in order to uh, mastermind his campaign. And um, he may not have been selected. He may now go for other selections, having learnt a bit from this campaign. I think that's going to be the interesting question. Did he decide he wanted to be in the arena because it's his hometown, Rochdale? Does he want to be an MP enough that he's prepared to consider another seat because if he if he does i mean he'd be a bit of a prize for labor they're looking for strong performers who understand westminster potentially ministerial material in the future so it's a possibility that labor might as we get nearer the election there's going to be you know this sort of idea that older mps the sort of the bed blockers free up those seats and put people like paul war in close to the election so we'll have to see does he want that or actually it was all he wanted to be the mp for Rochdale. Only Paul could tell us that, I suppose. Certainly it's been the case in previous elections that there have been a few selection proceedings in safe seats that are held right in the shadow. The election's already been called. The existing MPs decided at the last moment they don't want to fight another election. Let's 
get a selection process sort of streamlined through. That gives the central bureaucracy an awful lot of power over mm. who's then chosen. So I thought, Mark, an interesting insight in Paul's article in the eye was that there are about 350 local party members in Rochdale who he had to reach out to to appeal to them for the vote at the, the selection meeting. And when you think about that, it, Rochdale, it's a seat that's changed hands in the past, but whoever gets that seat is probably going to hold it for the next couple of parliaments at least, relatively safe. Yeah. Um, Labour aren't going to lose Rochdale, you would have thought. Yeah, I mean, it has, as I say, it has changed hands in, in, in previous years. But Anyone given remember the, Cyril Smith? Yes. Given the state of things, you'd think if Labour wins it next time, it's probably safe for the next couple of parliaments. So when you think about it, once you've got past the selection process with that 350 people, you've pretty much got that job for quite a considerable period of time. And it sort of reinforces Michael Crick's point that he was making on a previous episode about the importance of these local selections, that that is the key electorate in these safer seats. So there's always the question of how representative that selectorate, if you like, is of the wider voters out there and their constituency. It's quite a niche thing to be in politics to the extent of being even a party member these days. So- So that preference that Michael Crick again was talking about for the local champion, someone who's been a local councillor, knows the local issues, can speak about the local A&E or the bypass or whatever it is, over people with Westminster expertise. Because Paul Moore is a consummate Westminster insider, knows everybody, been around for ages. And there are a couple of other political journalists, Westminster insiders, Paul Mason, Seb Payne, who have been going for selections in various parties and haven't got anywhere. And you almost wonder whether the selectorates are very wary of the sort of rather gilded Westminster insiders, as they might see them, over local champions. Yeah, and I think in the end, the party in Rochdale chose the local councillor from Lancashire County Council. And from talking about people vying to be an MP to an MP who's decided not to continue, this week also saw the publication of a slightly harrowing letter from the MP for Finchley, Mike Freer, who's decided he's not going to stand at the next general election. And the reason he gave was because of the endless threats against him and his family. He's faced things like an arson attack on his constituency office, for example. And he's just decided he's had enough. And an awful lot of people from across the political spectrum have taken to social media to say how very sad they are that it's ended like that for him after 30 years in public service as a local councillor and then as a member of parliament. Yeah, of course, we've had, in recent memory, two MPs murdered. So you can understand the concerns when you, you're facing these threats. And yeah, particularly the, the concerns, awful cases of Joe Cox and uh, David okay. Amos. Yeah, and you can understand the concerns of the families being worried. And in his case, he was apparently one of the MPs on the list, alongside Michael Gove, of people that the person who ended up murdering David Amos was considering. I mean, this this guy had a list of, of MPs that he was sort of scouting out prior to the attack. And, 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 he, and he, when you hear that, that really must send yeah. a chill down the spine. Yeah, and as you say, there was an arson attack on his constituency office. And again, it's not just the MP and the family, it's also the parliamentary staff. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I Um, mean, when there was a knife attack on the then Lib Dem MP for Cheltenham, there was a member of his staff who was killed and he was wounded. So there are a lot of people in the firing line. And it must be one of the things that people now weigh in the balance when they consider going into Parliament. It's not all about adulation and people cheering you. Yeah. It's also about people threatening you, people trolling you endlessly on social media. And some of the stuff is absolutely horrific that is said about members of Parliament, particularly women members yeah. of Parliament, spookily yeah. enough, on social media. So there is a lot to take on if you decide that that's the life you're going for. Yeah. Uh, I mean, a number of MPs have talked to me about this sort of thing. One former Scottish Labour MP described to me how someone in his constituency would wait till he knew that MP was in Parliament about his Westminster duties and turn up on the doorstep and shout at his wife and family. We should also say in respect of, of Mike Freer's case that there's also a context in the situation in the Middle East. So he is not Jewish himself, Mike Freer, but but he has a heavily Jewish community in his constituency and he's been quite a forceful voice against anti-Semitism. Semitism. And he's quite pretty explicit in his letter announcing that he's not going to be standing again about the kind of pressures he's faced from some of the Muslim groups in and around his constituency. And that's something that I think particular Labour MPs as well are, are facing in some of their constituencies, that this conflict in the Middle East is starting to demonstrate itself in terms of splits and animosities and, and more in local communities and, and putting pressure on the MPs and their staff. 
And it only gets worse as you ascend the political ladder as well. I can remember a conversation with a former minister who was describing to me how they got a security briefing when they entered the government. And you must make sure that your children's faces don't appear on social media. You must do a different route every now and then on your school run. Oh, and when would it be convenient to come and put a panic button into your home? Yeah. I'd run. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, it, it is a real problem because if we don't find a way to resolve this we are going to end up with an even narrower group of parliamentarians in the future, people prepared to stand for Parliament. And your representative democracy, the quality and the range and the representativeness of it is going to reduce. And it's not just who stands, it's also how much they can do if they have to be surrounded by a security cordon in order to function at all as a member. And it's not just parliamentary elections. Interestingly, this week there's a piece of legislation that's been laid before Parliament to change the election expenses to uprate them for the GLA and other local elections, and it includes provision out with the election expenses for reasonable costs incurred in respect of security of candidates. So that's a sign of the times. And on that sombre note, time, I think, for a break, Ruth. If you're enjoying the pod and think like Mark and I do that Parliament matters, why not join the Hansard Society? This year we celebrate our 80th anniversary and throughout the year we'll have a number of special events to mark this important milestone. For as little as a cup of coffee each month, you can join us and follow in the footsteps of our first members, Winston Churchill and Clement Attlee. And if you're enjoying the issues that we're talking about on the pod, you'll also be getting our special members-only Dispatch Box newsletter each week, where we bring together the best news and stories about parliaments here in the UK and around the world. You can join by going to hansardsociety.org.uk slash membership. And we're back, Ruth, with a chance to take a look ahead at what's coming up in Parliament in the coming weeks. Yeah, so it's, it's by recent standards, it's going to be a relatively quiet week, I think, because it's the final week before a, a short recess. I always think of those scenes in Westerns when you say it's quiet, too quiet, and an arrow is sort of something, <laughs> something sticking out of someone's happen. chest. But <laughs> it does look like it's quiet business. It's the week before a short recess, and the business tends to be contrived in such a way that if people want to slope off early, they can slope off early. And whether it's to their constituency to engage with the electorate or to the ski slopes is a matter for the conscience of the individual Member of Parliament. <laughs> Before we get, though, to, to what we do know is happening next week, something I noticed that's gone down on the uh, the business papers of the House of Commons, we don't have a date for when it will be considered, but certainly something to keep an eye on. Is... There's a sort of coming up section called remaining orders and notices <laughs> where things without a date attached to them are put just to give early warning. Yeah, so, I mean, conceivably, I suppose they could stick it in next week with, uh, with a bit of notice, but I suspect it might come after recess. But... This is the motion regarding what's described as risk-based exclusion. So this is the the provisions that the House of Commons Commission, the sort of governing body of the House of Commons, has been considering to exclude MPs where they have been accused and are being investigated by the police, for example, of serious offences. So we've got a couple of MPs currently under investigation for alleged sexual assault, for example. Whether they should be excluded from the parliamentary estate as a, a matter of protecting the safety of everybody else on the estate. And that raises an awful lot of constitutional and procedural questions. Mm. We really mustn't underestimate how high-powered an issue this is, because you're talking about saying that the elected representative of a constituency can't come to Westminster to complete their parliamentary duties, has to stay away. Yeah, and there's a natural justice question as well for the MPs, because a lot of these cases drag on and drag on and drag on. There's a concern for the constituents who are not getting the full nature of representation. Their MPs can't, can't fully represent them if they can't go into the House of Commons, the Chamber and and committees and so on. And then there's a wider question. So this risk-based exclusion policy, the idea is that an independent group consisting of the clerk of the House, the director of security and so on, would consider the case. They wouldn't know the identity of the MP, but I don't quite know how that will work, but that they would consider the case and make a recommendation about what they think should happen in terms of what the nature of the exclusion should be. And there's questions there about how then do they represent their constituents? So the solution is, well, they should have a proxy vote. It should be kept under review. That then brings in wider questions about, well, who's entitled to a proxy vote? And if you are an MP who's, I don't know, whose husband is or or wife is ill in hospital and you are with them, you're not in Westminster, you don't get a proxy vote. That's not covered. Mm. But if you're accused of a pretty serious offence... 
You will. And that is actually quite a serious irritant. A very senior MP was rather sourly saying to me last week, you can be accused of groping someone and get a proxy vote, but if your kid's in, in a critical care unit, tough luck. Yeah, so it'll be interesting to see how this plays out because there's been a lot of criticism of it. House of Commons Commission has some initial proposals. They then sort of responded to MPs' concerns. They've taken it away and had a sort of another look at it. They're then putting this motion down. We'll have to see when it is debated, what dates are chosen for it. But I think it's one to look out for that there could be some, as you say, some irritation, and it's not a foregone conclusion that it will it will necessarily go through. Yeah. Um, I mean, part, of, part of the point of putting these things down and the order paper without a date attached to them sometimes is, is it's a way of testing the water, get yeah. people talking a little bit about something, allowing the whips to take the temperature, gauge whether there's going to be a lot of resistance to the ideas that they're putting forward. Because the, the Commons Commission and, and the parliamentary authorities in general sometimes come up with ideas that seem perfectly sensible to them having discussed it that MPs really don't like the look of. It's almost a recurring theme. It's a, a, some read across to the restoration and renewal issue, of, <laughs> which we talk about a lot as yeah. well, that uh, committees think, oh, this is a perfectly sensible solution. Yeah. And the wider body of MPs say, not on your Nelly. So. And if that happens, they can just leave the motion sitting there on the future business paper and effectively kicked into the long yeah. grass. Yeah. yeah, if it does look difficult it wouldn't be entirely surprising if it was basically left for the next government after Mm. the next election to get to grips with it then so you you can always kick these things into touch but it does as you say leave this very uncomfortable situation where there are a number of MPs who are basically staying away because of a kind of gentleman's agreement with the speaker and the parliamentary authorities that they won't come in it's fair enough at the moment in, in terms of it doesn't affect the cosmic balance of parliament it's not as if the government's majority would be destroyed by this but if you think back to the Theresa May years when Mm. the government didn't have a functional majority. Just imagine if one of those big Brexit votes on having a second referendum or something had been decided one way rather than the other because two or three people were excluded who would have tipped the balance. Imagine what would then be said about the legitimacy of that vote at a time when things were already pretty fraught. Yeah. Well, of course, she was heavily criticised on several of those votes because she gave the whip back to MPs who'd lost it for misbehaviour and quite rightly incurred a lot of criticism but by giving the Conservative Party whip back to them, she was hoping to secure more votes. It didn't work, but as you say, in a situation where you've got a minority government or some kind of coalition or whatever, these things could count, they could matter. A finger on the scales of history, you might say. (laughs) So, should we, looking ahead to what we do know is happening in the coming week, we've got the remaining stages of the Finance Bill in the House of Commons, so this is the... um, still my beating heart. Yeah, so this is the sort of outcome of the, the autumn statement back in, was it November... And of course, we're only weeks away from the next round with the budget. So no sooner will they have dispatched one finance bill than there'll be another coming down the conveyor belt. So meanwhile, the Chancellor performing a kind of dance of the seven veils, hinting that there'll be large tax cuts, then the Treasury nixing the idea of large tax cuts. And this horrible phrase, fiscal headroom, keeps being bandied around. Is there really room for 14 billion quid's worth of tax cuts before the next election as some kind of sweetener and vote gainer for the government? Or isn't there? It's like one of these soap opera will they won't they plots <laughs> um then we've got opposition day debate on tuesday but as we're recording we don't know what the subject matter yeah, is going to be so the opposition be... usually choose over the weekend don't yeah, they? yeah yeah so yeah. They'll, be, they'll be picking Take a look something. at the sunday papers yeah picking a, a dividing line no doubt education committee's looking at the impact of industrial action on students justice committee's looking at the prison population and estate capacity so you know some serious grinding through some of these big policy issues a select and... committee report that's out today actually is, is from the Leveling Up Committee yeah. talking about local government funding and the financial crisis besetting an awful lot of councils. And this has suddenly rushed up. I mean, local government finance is normally a pretty niche interest in Westminster. Every year they publish a, a local government funding settlement and that's debated and it usually consists of MPs saying, my patch should get more money. But the funding of local councils is now a very alarming subject for MPs because so many local councils have either gone bust or are about to go bust and are issuing these notices implying that they can no longer balance their budget. So they're desperate for an injection of funds. And this manifests itself at the MP surgery with people who can't get the social care they need mm. for relatives, who can't get the educational special needs of their children met. All sorts of things like that come home to roost. Car parking prices rise, the council tax increases the maximum permissible, etc, 
suffer, etc., etc. So it's suddenly become an incredibly toxic issue. And I think that that will be something that is raised rather a lot. As we're recording, there's a select committee statement being made by Clive Betts, the Labour MP and former councillor who's uh, chair of the Leveling Up Committee on this issue. And I think this is one that's going to reverberate quite a lot each time a council goes bust the recriminations will follow. Well, talking of organisations going bust, next Tuesday there's also an interesting statutory instrument to bring the water company regulations in line with current insolvency law. Um, Yeah, so, I mean, you know, we've all heard the speculation about the water companies being in a dire financial situation, can't afford the kind of investment in the sewage and the water treatment and all the rest that's needed. State of of water supply, state of rivers, reservoirs and so on, state of sewage in our seas is a big hot topic and uh, you know we've all heard the sort of rumours that some of the big water companies have maybe in in difficulties and and, and they and may end even, indeed end up in back in public ownership because yeah. the one thing the government can't possibly allow is for a water company to go bust and for yeah. the, the taps to, to run dry yeah so it'd be interesting to see what uh, what is said in that debate and then one i'll be looking out for a 10 minute rule bill so a form of private members bill on Tuesday as well, from Kenny McCaskill, who I think is a member Alba. for Alba. Yeah, so Alex Salmon's sort of breakaway group from the SNP. And he's proposing to expand the list of free-to-air sporting events to include Scotland's men's and women's football team for the World Cup and the European Championships. Of course, Scotland, having qualified for the next international tournament, hasn't done so for years. So, of course, the, the bill itself got no chance of really of, of becoming law. But I think he's going to make an important point here about, you know, if the England football team is covered, why isn't Scotland? Well, that's a, a good one. I bet some of the SNP MPs are kicking themselves for not having got there first. <laughs> but as you say, 10-minute rule bills are quite a low form of legislative life. They don't really yeah. very often, although it has happened from time to time, yeah. they don't tend to make it to the statute book. But it is a point that is increasingly hitting home with people. The number of big sporting events you need to pay some whacking great subscription to mm. some provider in order to see. Yeah. But the advantage, of course, of 10-minute rule bills is it's 10 minutes in prime time just after after ministerial questions. So, you know, it's a good opportunity, even if your legislation's not going to get through, good opportunity to get it on the agenda, get some media coverage and get a minister responding to the issue at the dispatch box. So we'll see what happens. And then Wednesday, Thursday, I think one of the sort of themes of both days is going to be the culture of the post office again, ah. coming back to for further discussion. So there's a, a question in the Lords about ministerial responsibility for the appointment of the board and the chief executive of the post office. And then on Thursday in the Commons, there's a debate on the management culture of the post office. And it um, be interesting to see who speaks in that debate. Well, well, indeed. I mean, given that there are, what, 16 former post office ministers who've been in office, or is it 17 former post office ministers who, who had been in office during the period of the post office horizon scandal. I'm not quite sure how many of them are still in the Commons, but uh, it'd be quite nice to hear from a few, not least from the Lib Dem leader, Sir Ed Davey, especially after the attempt to make him personally and solely responsible for the whole thing when he, as I say, he was one of 16 or 17 ministers who had some level of responsibility during this time. Maybe he didn't cover himself with glory, but what about the rest? Because there are Labour ministers and Conservative ministers as well as Lib Dem ministers involved in all this. Yep. I would like to hear from Ed Davey, actually. It might be a way to, for him to lance the boil of him being sort of saddled with sole culpability for this, which doesn't seem to me to be a particularly fair way to look at it. No, and, and key players like James Arbuthnot, who we had on uh, the earlier episode of the pod a few weeks ago. You know, he's been at the sort of heart of, of investigating this for years and raising it in Parliament. And he, he said he didn't think Ed Davey was any more to blame than any other minister, as have some of the post office campaigners. But it is, again, one of those themes that we've been going on about in this podcast, that the ministerial merry-go-round means that you have so many people, it's very, very difficult to point a finger of blame at one individual and say, it was him, what did it? Yeah, yeah. Okay, Mark, so that's it for the week ahead. We'll be back next week to report on all of that and no doubt much more. So I'll see you next week. See you then. Well, that's all from us for this week's episode of Parliament Matters. Please hit the follow or subscribe button in your podcast app to get the next episode as soon as it lands. And help us to make the podcast better by leaving a rating or review on Apple or Spotify and sharing your feedback. Our producer tells us it's important for the algorithm to give the show a boost. And Mark, tell us more about the algorithm. Well, what do I know about algorithms? You know, I write my scripts with a quill pen on vellum and then send it in by carrier pigeon. <laughs> 
Well, before we go, a quick reminder also that you can send us your questions on all things Parliament by visiting hansardsociety.org.uk slash PMEUQ. We'll be discussing them in future episodes, including our special Urgent Questions editions dedicated to what you want to know about Parliament. And you can find us across social media at Hansard Society to get more content related to the show and the wider work of the Hansard Society. Parliament Matters is produced by the Hansard Society and supported by the Joseph Rowntree Charitable Trust. For more information, visit hansardsociety.org.uk slash PM or find us on social media at Hansard Society.